What is going on, everybody? It's Boy Soto. That's Rory over here. As you can see, RJ is not here again. The Autumn Windbags, right back at you again with another episode. You know how we do. RJ is probably knee deep in horseshit. I think he's in uh, he's in Dallas for the UFC this weekend. That's why he's not here. Last week he was in the, the motherland, uh, Rory's motherland. Uh, he was in London, England, for the UFC out there. I didn't even a, get a courtesy text, man. Didn't even a fucking text. <laughs> he didn't bring you back any crumpets or whatever the hell they're called. I would have taken Nothing. some too. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and boy, that was a wet fart of a main event, huh? Oh man, it sucks. I was so pumped up for that fight. Probably yeah. just blew his knee out. It's horrible to watch that, man. I still, it just doesn't look good. It never feels good. Even though it's not happening to you, you still kind of feel something in your knee sometimes when it happens. It's horrible. Yeah, man, I've had an injury like that before. I mean, I had a head injury, and it was kind of weird because, like, no one could see it. It wasn't like I had a brace on or I had a scar or anything like that. But having to work back from that type of stuff, that's why I have a new, I had a newfound respect for Alex Smith when he came back to, uh, to play because he had a ton of surgeries. He almost lost his leg. He lost a lot of, a lot of muscle off, out of it. And that road back, people don't understand, man. That road back is hard. And people do it all the time. These these, these uh, athletes are big time, motivated, just driven driven people. And uh, from one person, uh, I know that, you know, I have people, uh, friends of mine and people close to me who have battled back from a lot of rough, rough stuff. I know you have family and people who battle back from a battling rough stuff it's hard man that everyday grind is not easy because there's some days you just want to stop you're like you know what let's just stop i'm okay but if i'm right now is where i'm gonna stay i'm okay with that then you have to slap yourself around be like nope that's not good enough we got to keep moving so uh yeah dude it's it's not easy man it sucks but uh i mean on the bright side rory's here giving us his Hard hitting opinions, nothing but nothing but hot takes from this man. Moving forward, straight ahead. Unlike RJ sitting on the fence, I think he likes sitting on the fence a little bit too much because this dude is like, yeah, I kind of like it, but yeah, I kind of don't. And then whenever like something happens that he he talks about, he has himself self covered either way. Rory, that's not the man. That's not Rory at all. Dad had an all. Ready to rock. Yeah, no bullshit, man. No, no one's got time for that shit. <laughs> no one got time for any of that shit, except for RJ when you do all the editing so you can always edit yourself to make, make yourself look good. Uh, yeah, he, he does some serious gymnastics when it comes to Derek Carr shit. I'll say. Like, if he's got an answer for everything. He's got a justification for everything. I think you and I both kind of come around on Carr after last season. Like, he proved himself for sure in a lot of ways. Obviously, he wasn't perfect and we still yeah. absolutely fell short, but... Like, he's come a long way, but earlier on, the arguments with RJ were just... Like, they were painful, man. Look, painful. the thing is, Derek Carr showed who I thought he was, was a great leader, good guy to have as a face of your franchise. He can make a star out of a nobody. You know, Hunter Renfro. I, these, are, these are all points that I hit that RJ was freaking shitting on me all over. Like, oh, you didn't take this seriously. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? All those fucking things came into fruition this year. So uh, the thing that we need, we need to see more of is he needs to get better in the red zone. He needs to stop fumbling the football. He needs to throw the ball more touchdowns. He needs to take more chances in the red zone, throw the ball more. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll see, man. 20, 24 touchdowns and 21 interceptions is not good, uh, especially when – Russell Wilson, the guy who we're saying, oh, he's better than Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson attempted less passes than Carr completed, and he threw 25 touchdowns and had, like, six interceptions. He was 23 TDs, 14 interceptions last year. I think you are talking turnovers, right? And he had like, seven fumbles, too. Yeah, the fumbles. Yeah, fair enough. That's crazy. I mean, he had a good year still. Like, he, he led us to the playoffs, man. I, I got yeah, he did. respect for him. He's, he's our guy. He's our leader yeah. behind him this year. No, yeah, I agree. Look, I'm happy with Derek Carr being our quarterback. What I'm saying is, if we want to, if you, we want to be a once every presidential election 
one and done playoff team, he has to play better. That's just sure. the simple fact. I'm glad he's our quarterback. I'm glad we have him to the contract we do. But every, what, to playoffs once every four years and being a one and done at, at those two times, not good enough. Not for me, at least. I don't know if commitment to excellence means something different to you, but it means something different <laughs> to me. That is, that's not excellence to me. Now, oh, Jay's listening to this at home, just like punching the, the wall. These freaking nuts are like all <laughs> boiling and shit. Okay, from one quarterback who signed a contract that we're jazzed about to another quarterback that signed a contract that we're jazzed about because we can laugh at it, Kyler Murray secures the bag if, if he actually acts as a professional quarterback. So crazy. So if you don't, if you haven't heard, and the reason I'm talking about this is because this is one of the reasons why I am glad that Derek Carr is our quarterback because we don't have to worry about this with Derek Carr. He went to OTAs. He was in. He he went to everything. Everybody went to everything. Chandler Jones was there. Devonta Adams, like everybody who signed, everybody was there. Kyler Murray signed a contract, two hundred sixty million dollars. I think it's 100 and, 100 and change guaranteed, 160, 180 change guaranteed. This fool <laughs> is so trash outside of the office, outside of the field, outside of the outside of the facilities that the team had to write into the contract that he must do four hours of independent film study per week. Not per day, per week. And if he does it, the Cardinals can void the entirety of his contract, which means no guaranteed money either. If they void your contract, like the like if 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 your contract has been voided for any type of reason, like for example, a lot of players in the NFL have like injury clauses for like motorcycles because they know these guys are alphas and they're dumbasses and they think they can, they're invincible, right? A lot mm-hmm. of players cannot own or ride a motorcycle. If they get injured doing so, guess what? They void their contract. Voiding means like if you void a check, it's done. No good. The contract is ripped up. You owe no money. With the advances in technology, not only can the Cardinal see when he's looking at his iPad, but what he's doing while the iPad is on. Is he not taking notes? Is he not rewinding film? Is he just watching it straight four hours worth of from one end to the other? Also, in the contract, it states he cannot play video games while he's studying. How much of a child, how little of importance do you place on being a quarterback and, and, and furthering your your uh, your progression that the team knows that you don't work outside of the facility. It's crazy. I've never, honestly, I can't recall a clause in a contract like this. Certainly, there's never been a clause in a contract this big before. He's the second highest paid quarterback in the league behind Aaron Rodgers now. Which, you know, you and RJ always talk about this, like the quarterback market resetting every year. Uh, I'm sorry, paying Kyler Murray the second most, 230 mil guaranteed. He is, he's just not that guy. He hasn't proven to be that guy yet. Uh, he's a good quarterback. He finds I mean, the, great moments. In, the first, but, in the first half of the year, he's proven he is, but in the right. last half, he sure isn't. Right. And then for this clause to leak, like it couldn't have been his agent that leaked this, sure. Ooh, that right? was so, all Cardinals. But it doesn't look good on the Cardinals either. Right? Like, why would you give $230 million to a, a, basically a glorified child that needs to be told as a requisite of receiving his $230 million that he has to do homework four times, you know, like four hours, four a, week hours a week on his Dude. own and not play video games on the iPad the team's given him? Like, it doesn't look good for anyone involved. It's crazy that it, it leaked. It doesn't. You know what? It, I'm, I'm thinking that they're probably saying, hey, uh, we believe in you. But we know you. Like, we we believe in you, but we know you, right? Uh, So, we believe that you will turn this around. But in case that you don't, 
we want to just get cut cut and because look film study is not just about learning the offense and, and learning your plays it's about tendencies for the opposing defenses too exactly and isn't it isn't it ironic that they put this clause in his contract and he team, that the team tends, tends to tail off at the end of the year when teams adjust to him and maybe he's not doing the study that he needs to on te- how teams have adjusted to their play, to their specific personnel. Because, you know, people get hurt and different guys step up. So they're defending them differently now than they were in the beginning of the year. So, you know, it's 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 really telling uh, that and, – and again, to bring this back around to the Raiders – we don't have to worry about that with Derek Carr. Derek Carr is the guy you have to kick out. Like, dude, go home and get some sleep. You have a family. You know, you got a pretty chill-looking wife. Like, go over and handle some business and, and then come back refreshed. You know what I'm saying? But Kyler Murray seems to be like, you know, almost like a Michael Vick. Because Michael Vick even said this, that if he took the progression of his play more serious when he was younger, he would have been even better. He didn't study film. He said, I'll just go out there. And I mean, Kyler Murray has even said this himself. He feels like he doesn't need to film study because he likes to go out there and just play. Yeah, and that's like, dude, that's that's all great, that's all well and good until it, uh, the defenses pick up on your offensive tendencies. Then you're fucked, and that's yeah. why I believe you know the second half of these seasons aren't that great. A hundred percent. I mean, dude, I'm, I'm, I just pulled up his stats right now just to refresh myself. It's, this isn't a Kyler Murray podcast, obviously, but still, we talk about cars, fumbling issues. In his last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games, he fumbled six times. He had some real stinkers in there. The Rams was a terrible game. Uh, I mean, he's again like when we were talking about the quarterback ranking. For me, and I'm, this is not Raider fan bias here, as you guys know, Carr is kind of uh, up and down for me. I pick Carr all day long over Kyler Murray. If you gave me an opportunity right now to trade one for the other, there's no fucking way. Oh, I wouldn't I would, do it. Not a chance. No way. You, 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 you could say, and you could argue that maybe Kyler is a little bit more gifted physically. But the thing is, it's like, it's, it's, I mean, I said it can be argued. I'm not saying it's yes or no. What I'm saying for a surely fact is similar to what we're talking about with Justin Herbert. Justin Herbert, there's no, it's hands down, he's a better athlete than Derek Carr. But, and he has better, better physical tools. But you can't argue that Derek Carr plays the position of quarterback better than Justin Herbert. He may not be as physically gifted, but the way he plays the position, how he handles the line, how he handles protection, that is because what do you call Justin Herbert doesn't have to do that. Kyle Murray doesn't have to do that. Uh, so there's a little bit of a difference there. Uh, um, I don't agree with you on the Herbert thing. I think Herbert's got him, but regardless, Kyle Murray, I, this number's insane. The clause is ridiculous yo man i'm trying to give car a little love and rory's just going in for the heart <laughs> i don't know what the hell's going on but we got a little trolling issue going on here got a little troll is a little bit of a cry baby got a little bit of ink that no one really knows exactly what it means recently likes to slick back his hair like he hasn't washed it in four days aaron Rodgers is trolling Devonte adams by saying well by, by going from, from having Javante Adams as your number one to Alan Lazard, Aaron Rodgers says, I mean, it's always tough going from one Hall of Famer to another Hall of Famer. From Devontae yeah. to Allen, it's going to be a trans- transition, but he's capable of a lot. Uh, part of me thinks it's pretty funny. And part of me is like, dude, he's going to be such a douche. He is the king of douches. He really is. Oh, God. I mean, the- you saw the, the Nicolas Cage thing. Yeah. I got to give him props to that. That was kind of funny. You know, it was well executed. He's making fun of himself. That's always a good look. Look, when someone who's like maybe not the most liked person in the NFL because of, you know, lying about COVID, you know, just digging himself a deeper hole, being such a baby about everything, being so open about it, basically running off your number one target, like the number one rated quarterback. Like, I mean, a lot of people don't put a lot of mu- a lot of interest into this, but the people at at Madden that do the video game, like their goal is to make this as realistic as possible. And if they know, if they feel that that Devonta Adams is the number one receiver in the league, he's still pretty fucking good. And you're running him off because you're just running your mouth and like talking about this and that and being a baby about shit. 
and you make fun of yourself, that's like, like you said, that's endearing. Like, oh, he's making fun of himself. That's cool. But if you're trying to troll, like, even if it's your, if you're just trying to be funny, it just comes off real douchey because that's just, you know, how people see him. That's how I see him. Yep. He's a douchebag. Sounds a quarterback, <laughs> but a douchebag. Yeah, One of my well, favorite American words, by the way, douchebag. Douchebag. <laughs> douchebag. You know what? I you know what? I, I I really admire the UK for their use of the word cunt. Oh yeah. It's it's yeah, it's yeah. totally different. It's like it's like the way we use fuck in the United States, that's how the UK uses cunt. I mean it's not as prevalent as fuck. It's uh it's definitely here it's very, very frowned upon, obviously. Okay, yeah. UK. If I if I offend anybody, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to like be so <laughs> forward with it, but it, I've been to the UK before. Roy grew up there. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just like any other cuss word in the UK. It can be said, you know, it all depends on how you say it. You know, it's not necessarily the word itself. It's how you say it. And, you know, we're, we're pretty creative with how we, uh, we cuss at other people. It's a beautiful thing. I think I remember this. So, this must have been a couple of guys that hadn't seen each other in a while. And let's say the guy's name is Rory. Hey, Rory, how you been, you drizzling cunt? That's not bad. That's, that's about, <laughs> that's, that's bad. right? That's that's something that I've heard with my own ears. But it's it's because of how he said it. He was probably saying it to a friend. Yes. You know, they probably had a pint afterwards. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? It's all about setting and delivery, man. It's freaking hilarious. Okay, so big news coming out of Kansas City today. The tight end that will remain nameless who, yes, did do a dating show. Uh, <laughs> people forget about that. It's like, how could you I, forget about that? I like the fact you bring it back because it, uh, it was kind of a bitch move, to be honest. <laughs> it really was, and he was so douchey on there. It, like, let's, We called Aaron Rodgers douchey this fool with yeah. the part in his hair and everything. Come on, guy. Okay. Yeah. The title that will, will remain nameless restructured his contract with KC today. Now, the reason why this is important for us is what he did and what the team did. The team took $3 million. So before we go any further, his uh, the tight end that will remain nameless, his contract calls for $7.5 million this year. That's what that's what excuse me, his salary is, without roster bonuses and like workout bonuses, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. His salary is $7.5 million. The team restructured his contract and took – look, all my hand gestures are making my shit go out of focus – uh, the team restructured his contract, so they took three million dollars off of one of the end years. He has three years left, and they moved it to this year as part of a roster bonus. So that roster bonus does not go against the cap, which is very important. Darren Waller, Darren Waller is in contract negotiations. We heard that he is. We heard he's going to play no matter what. So. On the plus side, on the yes side, it could be maybe like a little bit of a show of goodwill between the team and Darren Waller. We understand you're underpaid. We understand you're overproducing your contract. We want to make this up to you because, you know, you got two years left. Let's take a little bit of change from that last year. We have the cash now. We have the cash flow. Let's float that into a bonus for you this year. Maybe save a little bit of cap next year, too, while we're at it. Uh... On the negative side, Darren Waller is coming back from injury. That's not great. Kelsey has been with the same head coach, the same system for years. Got a new head coach, a new system, although all signs point to Darren Waller having a huge season if healthy. This has, they haven't worked together before. Um, also, Casey lost their number one target which makes Kelsey their number one target, whereas the Raiders gained a number one target and pushed Waller down from being a number one target. So there's a couple of positives and negatives going into why you would or wouldn't do this deal for Darren, or a similar deal for Darren Waller. I said it last week, I want to get Darren Waller more money. I think it sends the right message. I know you weren't necessarily as big of a fan of it, but um, I love so much about Darren Waller, the fact he's... You know, no one really feels like he's reached his potential yet. He should explode in this offense. Uh, McDaniel's obviously, uh, his work with tight ends over the years suggests that's going to happen. 
you know, he's coming off of an injury season, so if anything, his stock is probably as low as it will be right now. Uh, so I think it's a good deal, potentially, and it, it rewards, sends the right message in the locker room. Like, this is the guy that uh, homegrown, worked his ass off, has done everything the right way for the organization since he arrived, and he's also shown up to camp, which honestly, you know, when was the last time that you had a big superstar that was getting paid as low as he is? You know, he's a top four tight end in the league, and that's, you know, you can't dispute that after last season with Mark Andrews. Top four in the league, and his pay is is average. There's a huge discrepancy. Seventeenth, it's seventeenth in, in tight ends in, in salary. So it's year. technically below average, which yeah. is that discrepancy. The fact he's showing up, he's doing everything the right way. It sends the right message to give him more money this year. That's why I'm a big fan of it, even though he's got a couple years left and whatever else. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem with him doing something similar to what they did with the, the tight end that will remain nameless, just because I mean, it's not hurting you any. You know, all it's all it's doing is if you have the cash to do, I mean, it it uh, it's big, making a good a good showing to Waller and also the rest of the team that we're going to take care of you if you're one of our guys if you produce. Also, it saves you a little bit of cap in, in subsequent years, so maybe not a terrible thing. Uh, now he's never going to reach that last season. We're gonna we're gonna extend him before that next season starts anyway, but. It's a lot easier to play with and even lower that number even further on the first year of a contract. Maybe convert even more of that money into a bonus that year because there's only certain, there's a certain amount of money you can turn into a bonus for off, off of a certain amount of contract. So if you lower that anyway, and then you can lower it again when you restructure or sign an extension. So there's a lot of things you can do to play with it. I have full confidence in Champ and, and Ziegler up there to be able to get that done for us. Um, so, yeah, man, if you guys want to do it up there, uh, Rory and I, thumbs up. We say go yeah. ahead and do it. Give what pay the man his money. Okay. That shit done. In Saturday news, Saturday, I don't know who. I think this is pretty funny. Uh, Damon Arnett just can't keep himself out of trouble. Damon Arnett, this fool. Okay. If I'm driving on a suspended license. Okay, let's just let's just start there. If I'm driving on a suspended license and I get pulled over by the police and all they do is give me a ticket and say, listen, man, get your ass home. We're going to ticket you, but just get go straight home. Damon Arnett got pulled over in Miami. At maybe around two, maybe about probably around one o'clock in the morning. He's told, look, we know who you are. Look, go back in your car. Just get home. You are, you, we're telling you right now, you have. A, if you didn't know, now you know. You have a suspended license. Go home. Rory, I think you would go home. Absolutely. I, I, I would I, go home. That's a get-out-of-jail-free <laughs> card right there. Oh, no, I mean I wouldn't be stupid enough to drive on a suspended license, but if I had to, if something exactly. was an emergency, if, let's say he didn't know. Yeah, let's just man. say he. Didn't. But now you do. You have a suspended license, and not only that, but the cops are telling you, "Look, just go home. Your license is suspended. Now you do know. There's no bullshit like you didn't know." No, no, no. Not Damon Arnett. Damon Arnett continues to drive, presumably, to his dealer's house. Picks up some cocaine, drives around. The same cops see him driving around still, pull him over again, arrest him for now knowingly driving on it, an hour later for knowingly driving on a suspended license. And they found, I quote, they pulled him over again. Arnett was placed under arrest and cited for knowingly driving with a suspended license. According to CBS Miami, officers said they then searched Arnett and discovered a small baggie with a white powdery substance that appeared to be cocaine. Officers also found a straw that had been cut down, resembling a device common for cocaine use. Okay. Uh, if I'm driving on a suspended license and I have a white girl and some white girl on me, maybe I'll just go home. I don't know. That's just me. The guy is, he's, I mean, 
the thing that pisses me off about this isn't necessarily Damon Arnett. It's still Mayock. Like, when <laughs> I saw this news, it wasn't, oh, fucking Damon Arnett, what an idiot. It was, how stupid do you have to be to reach for this guy in the first round and to come out on record and say he passed all the character tests with a, you know, with flying colors. Like, just one of the worst draft picks of all time. He's already out of the league in two years. Unbelievably stupid what he did again. Dude. You know, I, here's the question. I, I don't know if this is, obviously we'll never, we, we won't know until much, much later on. But, uh, you know, we always used to joke about Damon Arnett tackling with his forehead. He didn't seem to have any, uh, any technique whatsoever or willingness to try to tackle with his shoulder, ever. Um, it was always head first, top, like crown of the helmet, forehead, straight into, it was either a high hit or, or something along those lines. Like this type of decision making over time that is so clearly like, what the fuck is he thinking? You have to, again, is this CTE? Is this early onset CTE? Because it's that stupid. It is that ridiculous to keep doing what he's doing. And he's 25 years old, man. The one, dude, I got to say about this as well. One thing that's pissing me off reading this news is that it's always former Raider, Damon Arnett. It's never former Chief, even though he was last a Chief. It was never former Dolphins. It's always former Raider because we drafted him, but he played for the fucking Chiefs. And we paid him money. He never played for the Chiefs. He, he didn't was play signed. for him, but yeah, he got signed up. He was, he was signed to a futures contract, so he never got paid. Uh, so, look at the deal. I agree with you. It, it pisses me off that former Raider, dumbass. Freaking predator looking ass. So, I mean, look, when you grow up being probably the best athlete that you've ever seen, I mean, from all accounts, he didn't work very hard. And uh, I'm not sure that you're going to start that in the pro. That's probably going to be your MO going through college. He was the third best corner on his college team, and the Raiders just reached for him. It's not his fault he was a first round pick. Hell, if, they, if someone shows me in the first round, I'd be like, fuck it. I know I'm not a first-round pick. I know I'm not a pick at all. I'm not even an undrafted free agent. I'm not even a cut. I'm not, a first, I'm, not even, I'm not even a camp body, okay? So if I get drafted in the first round, hell, I'm going to take the money, right? So it's just what kind of freaking personality test did they give him? Was it like – remember that, that movie? Have you ever seen Raising Arizona? No. It's, it's an older movie. It's with Nicolas Cage and John Goodman, and basically they're bank robbers in Arizona. And they have a daughter named, he has a daughter named Arizona. So they get caught robbing a bank, and then, like, the parole board is, now, boys, have you learned your lesson? Yes, sir, we'll never do it again. And they let him out over and over and over again. I'm like, that must have been his personality. He's like, listen, you did all this stuff. You're never going to do that again, right? Now that you have more freedom and more money, you're not going to do that any again, right? Nope, I surely won't. And it just keeps on happening over and over again. This just goes to show you how warped Damon Arnett's decision-making is. He feels that nothing is going to happen to him. He feels like he's invincible, that he's above everyone else, that he can do whatever he wants, and nothing's ever going to happen to him. He got caught driving on a suspended license, and the cops let him go which I believe reinforces the fact that he thinks he's going to be fine. Not only does he not go home and be like, phew, got away with that one. He's driving around knowingly with cocaine on his person and knowing he has a suspended license at like 2 o'clock in the morning. He was booked at like 3 o'clock, so he probably got arrested at around 2 o'clock. Yeah, it's freaking ridiculous, man. It's freaking ridiculous. So good riddance to Damon Arnett. Damon Arnett, I hope you do great things with the rest of your life, man. Just like I, I hope that you do. Just like I said with Alden Smith, you fucked up your career, but you know what? You have a lot of life after football to live. I hope you do great things with your life, man. But right now, you're fucking up. You got a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of opportunity to do great things. So hopefully, you straighten your ass out. Dude, you got thirteen million dollars from the Raiders. Thirteen mil. That's generational money. He could start businesses. He could buy real Bro, estate. He could do so much fuck shit. That shit up. Faster than, faster than Mike Epps. Fucked his money up. You can even fuck that money up quick. Okay. So, we got some sad news. Normally, when, when this happens, I'm happy for the person because, you know what, it's a decision that they made and 
whenever I've worked with somebody who's retired, I always wanted to throw them the biggest party because you know what? You did your job. You worked for that point until you don't have to work anymore. You've worked enough. It's time to just ride off into sunset and just spend the rest of your life living. Denzel Good announced his retirement a couple days after Richie Incognito announced his. Uh, so our starting two guards from last season retired within a week of each other. Uh, so what's next? What's next for off offensive line? So this didn't feel like the Richie Incognito retirement. This felt like a loss. Richie was more of a, a name, a coach. Like he, he didn't contribute anything. Obviously, Denzel Good last year was supposed to start, and then he got injured early. But we still knew, well, we still thought we were going to get a pretty serviceable starter that was versatile, could play multiple slots, and be depended on. So worst case scenario, we knew we were getting really quality depth across multiple positions. Him retiring was not only a shock, but it also took what was already a big question mark, already a big red flag in terms of our offensive line, and you know amplified it um so what did it do we're looking at presumed starters right now obviously no we know colton miller at left tackle john simpson first team reps at left guard finished the season strong last year we spoke about him last week uh andre james is center unless parham beats him out at center it looks like andre james is keeping that job and again he improved as last year went on right guard is a, an interesting one man the right side of the line is really interesting from everything that we've read, everything that we're being told, Lester Cotton is going to be the guy, or is currently the guy at right guard at least. He's getting the starters reps, which we haven't seen anything from him really in terms of meaningful snaps with the first team offense before. We know he was a, an undrafted guy out of Alabama. Um, he had some obvious limitations coming out, mostly related to technique, but also his movement skills. He was a big boy and he didn't particularly move very well. He was real heavy fit, heavy footed plotting. Yeah. Um, but super smart. He was a starter at Alabama, obviously it's a good pedigree. And uh, from all, all accounts, he's doing really, really well this year in terms of the off season. Um, who was it? I think it was, yeah, it was Brandon Parker. So Brandon Parker at his press conference on Tuesday said that Lester Cotton won the Samson award which I had never heard of, but I guess they give an award internally within the Raiders uh, correlated to performance in the weight room during the offseason. So the team or the coaching staff saw fit to award Lester Cotton as the standout performer in the weight room, which when you hear that as a fan and you hear that he's doing well and he's, he's earning the, the snaps at right guard, I mean, it all sounds really good. I mean, that was probably where good was most likely to plug in or at right tackle. Well, you've got Parker and Alex Leatherwood fighting for snaps with apparently Parker winning the, the, the first team reps and Leatherwood kind of coming in and, and splitting time, but it looks like it's Parker's right now. So that's where it leaves us. But the depth behind that, you've got Leatherwood who could be a swing right tackle, could be a right guard. Uh, you've got Parham who could cover left guard, center and right guard. We don't really have a backup left tackle. It's a skinny position group, no matter how you look at it right now. Yeah. Um, so on top of the players that you've announced, um, there's Illuminor, who used to play for the started, right. started what, 15 games for the Patriots um, a year the year before. Right. Uh, you have uh, Thayer Munford, who, uh, I mean, offered – to kick inside from right tackle to right guard his last year at Ohio State and did really well. He was uh, he was tied, I think, in, in all college football with the highest pass blocking rate, a uh, 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 grade for guards with Parham. So um, he uh, he's a, a name also if you want to have, like we talked about, the, the you're not your top five, but your top eight, nine-ish. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of names out there. Um Usually, normally, from teams that I've been on, your backup left tackle is your left starting left guard. Normally, that's how it works, is you just flip that left guard over to tackle. Uh, that's pretty scary if it's going to be John Simpson. I don't think he's built to be a tackle, but, hey, what are you going to do? Um, it's 
definitely an area for concern. Um, I I agreed with what we did last year because the, the, the com- composition of the team was not going to go where we needed it to go if we were spending that much money on such an old offensive line, regardless of how good or not good they were. The big issue was the whiff on Leatherwood. With Christian Darasaw right there, we could have gotten a plug-and-play right tackle who would have been zero problems. That would have been your right tackle for the next six, seven, eight years minimum. Uh, but we took we chose Leatherwood because of his versatility. Look, I'm not if I'm if I'm drafting a first round offensive lineman, I don't want versatility to be the first thing you tell me about this guy. I want this guy to be a rock solid guy for the position you're drafting him for. Not that he can play this and play this. No, hell no. Um, we I've had arguments with guests on this show about how terrible of a pick that was before he even stepped on the field. And I was talked down about how smooth he was and this and that, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, listen, bro, I just don't like it. Like, there's like, we talked we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and I talked about it on one of my shows, about how you you hear new leaders coming in and you hear some of the things that they say and how they describe things. And some things kind of give you a little cause for optimism. And some a little, sometimes they give you a little bit of pause for concern. Like, like we're talking about, like, like a, if you're talking about a fighter, like, you know, I, I, I coach at the gym. If you talk about a fighter and the first thing you say is he could take a beating, he's real tough, maybe you should not fight. That means you're getting your ass kicked a lot. Whether you win or lose, you're taking a lot of punishment. Maybe that's not something you want to do. If you're if you're touting a guy is so versatile at multiple positions and he's not really great at one position, that's not something that I want to do. Uh, I don't want to be revisionist history, but roll tape. I said Christian Darosaw was a better pick, and he turned out to be a better pick. He certainly looked like a better pick. I mean, that's who all the analysts picked, um, you know, as the better tackle of the two, right? I mean, Slater went, what, like four or five picks before? Four picks before the Chargers. I honestly think that that's who they wanted, and they'd locked onto that and thought that he might fall and then made peace with the fact that if he doesn't fall, they like Leatherwood more because of all the intangible stuff. Like, oh, he's a smart kid. He works his ass off. He could be molded into, you know, an, an all pro because he's got all the physical tools. Blah 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 blah. I hated the pick. I know you hated the pick. Uh, it kind of is what it is. But honestly, one of the things that is giving me cause for optimism with this is if we, let's say, we were to roll with Leatherwood as starting right guard instead of Cotton, um, it would mean that we have the f- uh, the same five offensive line starters that won the last four games of last regular season back-to-back-to-back to, back to, back to make the playoffs. Every single one of them is a young guy who should have got better over the course of this offseason, whether it's their strength and conditioning program, whether it's Leatherwood working on his technique. Uh, we mentioned John Simpson last week with obvious technique flaws of his that hopefully a new offensive line coach can kind of get out of him, which Cable, for some reason, couldn't. So, in theory, even though it looks like a bad position group, we could still be better than last year. And last year, it was enough to win the last four games of the season to make the playoffs. So, you know, add Parham into that. It, it, it's not doom and gloom, especially when you look at a team like the Bengals, who had a terrible offensive line and made it all the way to the big dance. You know what I mean? So it's not the end of the world, but I don't know. It's, it's an area I think we could improve. Definitely could improve. Um that's some cause for optimism. I do agree with that. I, I'm just not sold that the bar is set at every position and that each one of these guys individually meet that bar. Um, we talked about it before, and I've been pounding the table. One of the things about a team, an offense with Josh McDaniels is he's not going to play you if you're not dependable and if you're not at the at the point where he needs you to be as a player. So that kind of squelches, well, we're just going to roll out our best five to start. Because if one of those five isn't good enough, we're going to go outside and we're going to find somebody. And you actually had a, a quite a interesting uh, possibility, sir. Yeah. Uh, I mean, arguably, 
Well, I wouldn't say he's the best guy available, but there's a guy called Daryl Williams out there. He's a... Uh, Obviously, a lot of you guys probably know him, some of you probably don't, but he's a 29-year-old that really looks a lot like Denzel Good on paper, mm -hmm. in that he's super versatile, uh, he's very serviceable, he's, he was actually an All-Pro a couple of years ago, second team All-Pro, but he had a major, uh, I think it was a knee injury, two, in, two knee injuries, and he hasn't been the same player since those injuries, but he's a very dependable starter. He started for the, the Bills at right tackle the last two years in a row. He's reliable because he doesn't miss a lot of games, and he's super versatile. He can play right tackle. He also had some uh, some snaps at the guard spot. So it seems like a plug and play. You know, good retires. We need to fill that depth. We need a uh, a veteran that's versatile, tough. Um, you know, does everything right. Kind of an insurance policy as well. If Parker and Leatherwood don't get their shit together this year, um, the only problem is the Bears went and signed Riley. Rife, or Riley Reef. I don't know how to Reef, say his last Reef. name. Reef. Uh, I've always seen his name. I've never like heard it. But he's a, a right. pretty fucking average dude, and they gave him 10 mil base with 2.5 uh, in incentives this week, which undoubtedly uh, increased Daryl Williams' price tag. But still, if we've got the cap, I think that's a move to make for sure, even more so than possibly in Dominican Sioux. Like, we need the offensive line depth arguably more than we need... The defensive tackle depth, although that's, you know, with the injuries we have, you can make a good case for both. Yeah, you know, honestly, I I think myself, um, this is a position that we should spend if we have cap space and we're going to spend the cap space with, which if you're a team, you're going to want to spend your cap space. You don't you don't get it back. Um doesn't roll over. Yeah, it doesn't roll over. So um, maybe because of the injuries, the pup list to Bilal uh, Powell and uh, Jonathan Hankins, uh, you go after a defensive tackle, but you also drafted a couple uh, and uh, you signed a, you know quite a few more. Um, but it is an area for concern of ours. Um Definitely also in the run game because you know that Josh Jones is going to want to run the ball. So he's going to be a little bit more picky on the offensive line. Uh, mm -hmm. There's other options out there. I don't know that Eric Fisher has shown that he's the player that he was previous. Um, Dwayne Brown. Didn't, didn't Dwayne, that was Orlando Brown. Sorry. Yeah, Orlando Brown. Brown with the Chiefs. Dwayne yeah, Brown's the left tackle for the Seahawks that – I mean, he's been a stud his whole career, but I think he's, he's super old at this point, and he might not be willing to come. Especially, you know, he's not going to be a backup left tackle. Yeah, he's going to if he comes in there, he's probably going to switch over to the right side if it's possible for him to do so. I don't think so. Um, you're not going to sign a guy like that just for depth at one position. So you're going to want someone who's a little bit more versatile, like you said, like a, uh, a Denzel Good type. Dude, that was Denzel Good. Denzel Good was kind of floundering over with the Colts. We picked him up as a depth guy, and he ended up, you know, turning the corner later in his career. Uh, definitely not something that we are feeling great about our offensive line. But like you said, it could be a thing where um, just the fact of familiarity with the, the five, uh, could, they could be uh, the, the sum could be uh, the total could be greater than the, the you know the individual pieces. So. That's kind of the key, actually. So that's uh, there was some good presses this week from training camp. There was um, Andre James had a good little soundbite when he was talking about uh, the importance of continuity and chemistry and communication along the offensive line, and being able to play with the same guys. There's so many uh, efficiencies to that, and that's obviously why we saw the uptick in terms of their performance to end the year last year. And it was because they started to, to feel comfortable with one another and develop that sort of chemistry that you need along the offensive line. Um, there's also Brandon Parker had a presser. I watched that because I, I really want to get a vibe for Brandon Parker this year because a lot's riding on his success. If he is our starting right tackle in the AFC West, like, goddamn, he's going to be tested. And so far, he hasn't necessarily been up to that test. Uh, not because of the 90% the of good snaps that he has, it's the 5 to 10% of bad snaps that he has that's, you know, it's going to get car 
killed. You know, it's going to stall us out on third down or whatever it is. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's unfortunate because he has so many good reps for for so few negative ones, but the negative ones just can't happen at the NFL level. But he had a good presser. He was talking about trying to clean up penalties this year. That was a big focus of his over the off season. He also said false starts and holds. Uh, he just had too many of them. They hurt the team. Um, he said that him and Leatherwood do hear the criticism. Um, Good. Right. I mean, he wasn't necessarily zeroing in on it, but he says that professionals, even if you're not looking for it, you're going to hear it every now and then. And apparently, I can't remember if it was the, uh, the reporter mentioned this or if it was him that mentioned this, but uh, the idea that the offensive line is the weakest unit on the team he said it just puts a big chip on their shoulder, which, you know, as it, as it fucking Good. <laughs> right? You know, um, I, I'm speaking about accountability, um, I read that uh, it's something that's they're calling, like, you know, the big A, accountability, right, in the, in, in the team. And um, if you make a mistake in practice, you take a lap. And uh, the reporter said, yeah, I saw Derek Carr and Dylan Parham running around the practice field because they had a muff snap, a muff exchange, uh, which showed number one that everyone is fair game, and number two that Parham is taking first team snaps at center. Yeah. So no, he has been, dude. He's been apparently he's been switching in and out, which um, I, I feel like I always call him out on this show, but I, I listened to tape. Don't lie with uh, BD and and Marcus Quarles. Marcus, often. yeah. They're yeah, good. those guys put out some great shit. They they study the game. It's, Fre it's friend, friends, of, friends of the windbags, yeah, both of yeah. them. Great guys. Um, and uh, what did he mention? He was mentioning something to the effect of... Um, uh, <laughs> I just completely lost my train of Andre thought. James is, <laughs> Andre James's lack of strength and the different... Yeah, different that, sorry, that's what it was. My bad. Yeah, Come I mean, on, bro. Like, it, it wasn't necessarily Andre James' lack of strength. It was Parham. He said something about Parham in college... He didn't think he necessarily had the strength to be able to play as an NFL guard, which I thought was a really interesting uh, assessment because, uh, admittedly, I haven't watched a ton of Dylan Parham tape. So, I, you know, everything that I had read in terms of his draft analysis, uh, which is, again, it's secondhand. Like, I haven't, I haven't watched the tape like those guys on Parham. Uh, was you know they don't call out a lack of strength at all he plays low he's a, a big strong dude well he's not huge relatively speaking but he plays with leverage he plays low pads low uh and i mean he's a hulking dude man have you seen images of him yeah like, he's, he's a he's kind of like an aaron donald in terms of like just being a stocky cannonball type dude. motherfucker yeah which dude i thought that was really interesting because obviously we drafted him it looked like we drafted a guard with potential needs of guard uh but Marcus at least thinks that he's a better center or projects better as an NFL center. So it's an interesting one because, you know, Andre James didn't necessarily light the world on fire last year. So maybe his job is up for grabs. And I like the fact that they are testing them out with Carr in the first team offense. Yeah, well, I mean, again, like we talked about, the best five are going to play. They're going to start and the best eight ish are going to play. And uh, honestly, uh, it, it's very difficult for you have to be a. I mean, if you draft a center in the first round, let's just say, for example, you draft a center in the first round, his probability of sticking is through the roof. Those guys translate. There's no position like the offensive line to translate to success in the NFL. Uh, so it's you have to be a special talent to be drafted up high at that position at center. We've seen it a, long, a lot of times before where guys come in early and they play guard and then they, they get kicked into center. Andre James was kind of a swing guy, center guard his first few years. He didn't really play too much. And then when the position opened up, he took over at center. Um, so I could see that happening for sure. Uh, I could see Parham taking over one of the guard spots maybe just to get him on the field and get him some experience. And then, you know, it's not really smart to switch out centers mid-game if you don't have to. But uh, definitely giving him some run at center would be good because if that's what you're looking for in the, in the future, it's a very uh, – important position on your line so uh yeah i don't see why you wouldn't give him a, a little bit of more experience that down there yeah no doubt man um today was actually the first day of hitting it was the first day of pads at uh, practice yeah 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 first thing wednesday morning they uh 
It was funny. Colton Miller and his press <laughs> seemed super juiced about it. He was ready to start hitting people. Uh, obviously, the fullback, the new fullback, Josh McDaniel said he's probably the happiest guy to start hitting too. Um, but some early reports out of camp today was, again, apparently Lester Cotton had a really good day. They said that Jonathan Abram had a couple of flashes. Lester Cotton had a good day. Um, yeah, but knock on wood, no injuries, man. Yeah, man. So I was reading a book. I read a lot of shit about the Raiders, right? I was, re- I was reading something about players that are going to make a leap in 2022. So um, Greg Rosenthal, the editor from around the NFL, he uh, wrote a player on each team, right? He isn't always the biggest Raider backer out there, but I think he made a good a good uh, selection here. Then, you know, I think Rory and I have a little bit of a different selection as well. But uh, he, he talked about who's going to make a leap in 2022, and um, his choice was Rocky Sin. Uh, he talked about uh, Rocky Sin, how uh, well he played against in man-to-man coverage last year. I think he was the sixth-ranked corner in man-to-man coverage last year uh, for According PFF. PFF yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> if you're the sixth-ranked in anything in PFF, or does that mean you're the sixth best? No. But it means you don't suck. It means you're one of the best in the league, okay? Like, like if they say you're the absolute worst at something in the NFL, does that mean you are specifically the absolute worst? No, but there is area for improvement. So if you're if you're being rated in the top ten at something, does that necessarily mean you're number six? No, but you are a pretty good man to man corner then, if you're ranked that high. Uh, yeah, I mean it's a data point, right? We always talk about that yeah. with PFF. It's it's, I hate. A lot of those guys over there, because they they speak as if their subjective opinion is objective fact, and it isn't. They're mm-hmm. assigning grades based on their opinion at the end of the day, right? But they are still grinding the tape, and it is still a really valuable data point. And for him to be ranked as highly as he was in man coverage can only be a positive thing. He passes the eye test, too. Like, you go back and watch Colts footage. He, he's a sticky man press cover corner. Well, also, something that's not subjective is Rock Yassine only allowed 4.6 yards per completion last year. And that's second in the league. So um, awesome. that means he doesn't, you know, as, as much of a, a as, as much of a kind of a grief he gets for not being a willing tackler, he's not letting too many guys shake him after they make the catch. So, um, you know, Carr, when he played the Colts, Carr was not completing very many passes on Rock Yassine. He had a pretty pedestrian game against the Colts. Um, don't ask me how we won that fucking game, uh, but we did. Uh, you know, Carr went 24 for 31, um, 255 yards. He had a touchdown, but he also had two picks in that game. And I think he fumbled too. Uh, so that's a good jumping off point. Uh, Rosenthal, Rosenthal did say that uh, – easy for me to say. Rosenthal did say – that it was uh, that Trayvon Mullen was also a very uh, it was tough for him to make a choice between Yasin and Trayvon Mullen because he feels that both of those can really break out in uh, Patrick Graham's system and Patrick Graham's specialty is the secondary he goes in there and he fixes secondaries which is what we need because we're very young in the secondary um, but I have a different choice and Rory you have a different choice as well please. Continue. All right. Uh, for me, it's got to be Trayvon Merrick. I'm going Trayvon Merrick. Uh, I don't think there was any great candidates offensively, to be honest with you. Um, you could do offensive line. <laughs> I'm not going to say Leatherwood. Uh, so defensively, we really need to step up. As you said, Graham is known for fixing secondaries. That's his uh, specialty, if you will. So it was honestly, it was between our two safeties. It was either going to be Jonathan Abram or, or Merrick. Merrick last year was a serviceable, solid starter. He was a dependable starter. He did everything well. He, uh, he justified the draft uh, status and the pick in the second round. He showed everything that we thought he could do from his college tape. Uh, he left a couple of plays on the field, like we all know he did, but he was at least in position to make those plays. 
and he's a sure tackler. He took good angles. He's got coverage range. Like I really like him here and now, but uh, the potential of how good he could be, he looks like he could be one of the best safeties in the league. And with Graham as your head, as your defensive coordinator, it, he's my pick. That's a great pick, man. Uh, definitely, I, I, he didn't, he never got beat deep last year. No one ever beat, no one, no one threw over, threw over the top of Trevon Merrick last year. Um, like you said, that's a lot of plays on the field, um, and. That was with a very vanilla style defense. He was in the position to, he was, he found himself, he being Trevon Merrick, pronouns pal, did it again, found himself being in position to make those plays. I think that Patrick Graham is going to make it even more of a point to put Trevon Merrick in positions to make big plays. And with another, uh, another season under his belt, a uh, season of, uh, you know, experience, maybe he's going to make those plays a little bit more consistently. Now, my pick is a guy who came on really strong last year. And the reason why uh, Littleton is no longer a Raider, his name is Divine Diablo. The reason why, uh, by all accounts, the Divine Diablo bulked up in the offseason. He's a little bit more of a linebacker type body now, but he's still a little bit lighter for linebacker. He's more stringy and wiry, fast, uh, which is the kind of player that Patrick Graham loves. He loves linebackers that can defend the pass. Um, and that's Trevon, and that's, excuse me, Divine Diablo, uh, considering he was a four, uh, three-year starter, I believe, safety at Virginia, Virginia Tech, uh, excellent player as safety. And he comes and moves into linebacker and doesn't miss a beat. Takes on tackles, uh, tackles for loss, uh, able to knock down passes, got a sack. So I think that building on top of the experience and the confidence that Divine, I mean, the Divine Diablo never lacked the confidence. He just never got the opportunity. But uh, having more confidence and the ability to, his ability to learn and absorb this new defense is, gonna, I think, going to be the biggest thing. Uh, that's either going to hinder or help Divine Diablo moving forward this year because Patrick Graham loves players like Divine Diablo. Yeah, he had a good presser on Tuesday as well. He, he said that he's added size. He's got more comfortable with the, the linebacker position because, again, he sort of – that transition happened very quickly last year. And it's honestly amazing that he was able to step into a linebacker role so early and do so well, uh, considering how difficult that change of position is. So credit – uh, Gus Bradley in that defense for, for being able to coach him up to that point. Um, he said he just wants to earn the trust of his teammates, earn the starting role. But he, he highlighted working on his run defense and getting off blocks in the offseason, which mm -hmm. uh, he, he's just got great awareness uh, athletically. He's obviously a modern linebacker. Uh, I'm right there with you, man. And he wears, I, honestly, wearing the number five still doesn't look right to me, but it makes him stand out. You know what I mean? Like you always see him on the field because he's wearing that number five. Um, but I'm excited about him. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, he has freakishly long arms. So that's one thing that I love that Khalil Mack did is when he rushed off the end, he just shoved his arm right in, right in the chest of the, of the tackle and just held him out there. Uh, I really like Divine Diablo. I really like his play. I like his confidence. And it just goes to show you, even if you're maybe out of position a little bit, if you're a dog and you can play, you're going to be – they'll put you on the field and they'll, they'll figure it out. He made the, what, $16 million man, uh, Corey Littleton, he made him a freaking special, special teams player uh, towards the end of the year. Um, and uh, it takes a, spe a special kind of guy to keep working at it, knowing that you have the highest player on your defense that year uh, ahead of you. And he knocked him down and took his job and made him play special teams. So – Devon Diablo is my pick uh, for to. I mean, honestly, I'd be chill with either one of these four with Yassine Mullins, uh, Merrick, or Devon Diablo. If any one of these motherfuckers break out, it's going to be good for us for sure. Honestly, imagine if it's Jonathan Abram, though. I know it seems Bro, it very can be, dude. It, it, can seems, be. <laughs> it seems very unlikely, but what if it is? Imagine if Jonathan Abram turns into a premier uh, strong state. I year. do look, man. I. <laughs> I believe what I see, and rarely, rarely, rarely do you see a player 
that completely flips around without flashes of something. He has shown zero against the pass. That's the key against the pass. Yeah, he's uh... now against the run. He can be look if 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 uh, Abram can can pull a divine Diablo, and he can pack on twenty five pounds of muscle and be a linebacker or a modern linebacker. I'm all for it. But this dude cannot cover in space. He had a third string running back beat him down the field for a freaking ball, and he made him look silly. It just he just is lost in space. He's lost in coverage. He's lost with the ball in the air high, and that's not what you need from a safety. And, look, I know that people can improve, but that's a big jump that you're lo- you're looking to being one of the worst in the league playing the ball in the air to being somebody who you can count on consistently. And that's something that not only let, – let, let, let's not pull Patrick Graham out of this and, th- and make him out to be this nice guy. He's a tough coach. And – he knows what he wants, and he expects, just like I said, uh, Josh McDaniels is not going to roll out with an inferior offensive lineman because he knows what he needs. Same thing goes for Patrick Graham and his defense. If you can't play in his system, you're just not going to play. You're going to be a special team stalwart. I think, though, with, with Graham, and he said this again in his press recently, uh, his whole thing is just putting guys in the best position to be successful. And I think you look at Abrams' play so far – from rookie to now, and you say this is not a guy that's going to thrive in a too high safety type defense. Mm-hmm. If he's got to go, uh, if he's got to cover, uh, you know, one half of the field and have good awareness in a zone or anything that requires him to cover in space, it's not going to go well. That's that's unless there's miracles that are performed by this coaching staff this off season. I would say that that is a severe limitation of his game. At which point, what can he do? What can he do well? Well, actually, so when he did flash last year, I think it was against the Chargers at the end of the season. He had a a real nice game. Um, You know, if a a running back or a tight end or a fullback is is going out in the flat and that's his assignment, he's going to blow him the fuck up. He's going to come in like a missile and he's going to blow him. I agree. But here's the issue with that. Here's the issue with that, though. Andy Reid ruined that because anybody he motioned to make sure he found who Abram was on, and he sent him deep every time. That's why we saw a third-string running back go deep and catch a a deep touchdown pass on Jonathan Abram because anybody who he's covering, okay, we we identified it, now send him deep because we know he can't cover him. I mean, there's there's some some ways to defeat the the cover three, right? There's – I mean, look, again, what's Abram going to do this year? I think he's got to play close to the line of scrimmage. I, I don't think he's a three-down strong safety. I, I can't imagine Graham putting him through the offseason and training camp and coming to any other conclusion than that. And our linebacker rooms are already pretty, like, as a position group, it's pretty stacked right now. You know, you know honestly, stuff. it was one of it was one of the positions that – was a little bit of a cause for concern before free agency. Mm-hmm. But, you know, J.M. Brown, uh, freaking – who else did we get? That guy from uh, – Fackrell. Fackrell. Fackrell's more of a DN. He's, he's a linebacker, yeah, but he's going to be more of an outside linebacker pass rusher. Um, we, we picked up a couple other guys too. And, it's you know, going to be Perriman, Brown, and Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the three that are going to be most playing most on the two inside positions for sure. Um, uh, all right, man. So, you ready for some what up win bags? Let's do it. Let's do it indeed. Boogie, that's his name. Boogie says, Agreed that Carr does and has admitted that he does whatever the coaches want him to do and tries not to go off script when on the field. But I want to see him take things into his own hands if he sees something that he can take advantage, even if it's not what McDaniels had planned for the play. Extend the plays, go off script every now and then if it means you can give more positive plays. What we talked about was uh, that was in response to, I think, one of my um, videos about Carr being a little bit more salty, a little bit more aggressive during a press conference, and that I liked it. I liked him 
And I, I, I likened it to how you can't always be the good little soldier because you see things on the field that maybe someone doesn't because you can feel it a little bit more. And how uh, Gruden and Gannon had some screaming matches on the sidelines before. But it's because, you know, they disagreed on stuff and just saying yes or yes or yes or every single time maybe isn't the best way to go. Not for sure. Um, I don't know, man. I'm torn on this. I Derek Carr seemed to throw the ball away more last season than he had in previous seasons, and I kind of like that. Like, if the play's not there, I, I didn't necessarily want Derek Carr to be an improviser because it's not necessarily what he's good at. He did a lot better in the pocket last season uh, in terms of feeling the pressure, in terms of extending plays. I don't love Carr outside of the pocket. I don't think it helps his fumbling issues. I don't know if I want a ton of improvisation from him post-snap, where he made huge leaps under Gruden was pre-snap. I felt like he was supremely confident in that offense, and he had the ability to check and change plays, and often that that was really, really effective, even towards the end of the season, which is when, in theory, teams should have the most tape on you, right? And he was still able to beat defenses, which he's not going to be able to do that unless he has complete control over that offense, and it's a nuanced offense, right? But um, I just don't... Like, go back to the Bengals game, the last play of the season. That's obviously the one that's going to stick out in your memory. Uh, he didn't change pre-snap. It was a play that didn't make sense. Uh, you know, trying to run it at the sticks in that scenario didn't make sense. He didn't check out of it. Uh, post-snap, he still arguably was too trigger-happy. He threw it to the guy that really had a very, 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 very low percentage likelihood of being able to convert into what we needed in that moment. And that's the side of the Cars game that even though he's a veteran and even though all season it was improvement upon improvement upon improvement, like it came down to that play and I can't figure out what the fuck he was thinking, what he was doing. And it's it's always the missed opportunity that hurts the most, right? Yeah, man. Hold, hold that ball a little longer. Uh, test the outsides. Like it just... Throw it to your matchup nightmare, Waller. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a rough end it was to a rough year. End. Yeah, you know, look. There's definitely things that he needs to clean up. The fumbling we know about. Post-snap, yeah, he, he can be fooled like Patrick Graham did last year. Fooled the shit out of him last year. His, he he did had a terrible second half against the Giants. When that was still a very winnable game. Yep. Um, you know, you talk about pre-snap. That was a pre-snap. He did not change the play. The play was defended very well. Um, we talked about pre-snap. You know, RJ disagrees with me. I've talked to plenty of people about this, people who have coached, people who have played. And um, when you see your best pa- – the, the, the opposing team's best pass rusher and your offensive line is set for your tight end to handle him one-on-one, coming from your blind side, and you – take your drop and you hitch twice that's your fault you can't expect a tight end one-on-one to block their best pass rusher and you to hitch a couple times you hit that back foot that ball's going to go out either it's going to the to the receiver or you're throwing it out of bounds because you know that you don't have a lot of time uh post snap he's he's mobile enough to extend a play he's not tom brady out there he can go he can extend a play He's not mobile enough to like get a bunch of yards and like attack a defense with his legs. But I would like to see him throw the ball deep more on broken plays or on off script plays. More often than not, he's a check down Charlie when it's kind of an off script type of thing. He'll look for a guy to check down or a, a shorter pass. The play, the other, because the, look, the other guys in this division, Mahomes, Kerbert, and Wilson, they're going to look to throw the ball deep. If they if they get outside the pocket and look around, they're gonna, they're looking to hurt you. Um, That's true. That's yeah. a great point, actually. All right, Matthew. We have these sweet names. We have Boogie, the first one. Matthew, that's his name on, on, on YouTube, says, if Carr wins one Super Bowl, he'll be in the Hall of Fame. Not the first ballot. Obviously, he's broken all the Raiders quarterback records. Hopefully, he cleans up a lot of his flaws. I personally do not feel that just one Super Bowl will make Carr... Uh, Canton bound. 
I think he's going to have to play the next four to five years at a an elite level at, on top of a Super Bowl, on top of a couple other deep runs to be considered, and again, not a first ballot Hall of Famer, just because the era that he played in is a passing era. His numbers did not equate, and I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not saying that it's his fault or it is his fault, but the numbers that he put up does not equate with the wins and losses that he put up, and they're gonna and, and voters are gonna look at the entirety of everything. And I understand that maybe Raider fans may excuse some of those things because of how poorly the Raiders were run and how poor some of those teams were. But I guarantee you that Hall of Fame voters will not make excuses. Yeah, he's not a, a, a Super Bowl away from being a Hall of Famer. I mean, it, <laughs> it certainly helped his legacy. But, um, you know, let's talk about some just basics. We're not just talking wins and losses here, even though that does matter when you're talking Hall of Fame. Um, even though it's not necessarily his fault for a lot of these losses, obviously. But he's got to be throwing at least 30 touchdowns a season as the bare minimum in a modern-day NFL his touchdown to interception ratio should be at least two to one, bare minimum in the NFL. Uh, you know, he, he puts up a ton of yards. Uh, he's been an incredible player. Like, I, I don't want to pull away from how good Derek Carr has been for us. Um, and again, he's our guy going into next year. But all this talk about him being a Hall of Fame quarterback, I think it was obviously an off-season slip of the tongue from, from Devontae Adams backing up his buddy. And statistically, is it in, impossible that he could make the Hall of Fame? No. If he comes out and has, you know, four to five top five quarterback seasons in a row and adds a Super Bowl ring, then maybe, maybe it can overcome his career to date. But the likelihood is so slim. Look, if, if, if it took Tom Flores 40 goddamn years, 50 goddamn years to get in, I, I just don't see it, man. Uh, ultimately, I just don't see it. I'm sorry. Uh, Oscar 408 writes, Whoa! Rory is real. <laughs> we talk about you, and maybe some of the newer fans out there uh, don't know or didn't know who you were. When we first started the Autumn Windbags, it was the three of us. The Rory had to go and big time us. And he was kind of like one of the temptations. <laughs> he was like like one of the Commodores. He's like Lionel Richie. Like, look, I'm not going to be a part of the Commodores anymore. I'm going to be myself. I'm going to be Lionel Richie. Like, you're like Beyonce. No more Destiny's Child. I'm just Beyonce. But now he's back on the scene with the gangster lean. It's my brother from another mother. Yeah, man. It's look, I, uh, I was having a lot of fun with this with you guys. And, um, Obviously, this all came about through a text thread that we've had for, for like 10 years, yeah, I want to say, just the three of us. Years, yeah. yeah, and I mean, this what you guys are hearing right now on this pod is exactly what's been going on in that text thread for the last 10 years. So it's just three dudes that love talking about Raider shit, real passionate fans. Uh, we don't agree on everything, not even fucking close. But, uh, you know, if you're subscribed to this podcast, you're probably the same. When news comes out about the Raiders, when it's draft time, when it's training camp time, uh, you can't switch it off. You know what I mean? So initially, I didn't, I, I, I'll be honest with you guys, I didn't see this being uh, a big time commitment. I hadn't really figured out what it was going to look like. And I, I'm usually insanely busy this time of year with work. And I just didn't have the bandwidth for it, even though I was still texting you guys and following along every week. But uh the stars have aligned, and uh, I've got a little bit of time right now and wanted to hop on with you guys, so it's, it's good to chat Raider football. You know, one of the things, uh, I think I remember what was the first thing that I, I text both of you, and I don't know how I remember this, but I, it, I think it was you guys. When Jason Campbell got injured, I think we were like 4-1 and one or 4-2, and two and we were winning that game, and he got injured. He, he separated his shoulder. And I text you guys, I think, I feel like I just broke my dick. <laughs> because we hadn't made the playoffs in God like 10 years at that point. I think it was like 2011, 2012, something like that. Hmm. And uh, I'm like, dude, I think I, I felt like I just broke my dick. Like, what the fuck is going on here? Tom Cable had us humming. We had Jason Campbell. He was, he was, 
had that arm, the strong arm to get the ball down the field. But he's more of a check down guy, mobile. And we were, you know, the offense was running well, and he gets hurt, and then we trade. Uh, Hugh Jackson trades the freaking farm for uh, Carson Palmer. <sighs> Fuck man, Hugh Jackson. I mean, dude, I, I, twenty years flies by when we're talking NFL shit, right? Like two thousand and two, the Super Bowl that year against the Bucks, Gruden. Rich Gannon, Jerry Rice, Tim Brown. You know, Barry that, Robbins. That, yeah, Bill Romanowski, Sam Adams, Charles Woodson, Rod Woodson, Garrett Gibson. You know what I mean? Like, you can go back to any one of these eras. And I, I couldn't tell you right now. I wouldn't be able to put them all in a row. But if you started talking about those teams, I could go into detail on every single player and how those seasons went because we lived it. You know what I mean? And we're still here. And honestly, I always say this to people. When you support a team like this that has had – you know, it's been so terrible for so long. It makes the games like that Charger game to end last season for us making the playoffs. Like, that was the fucking Super Bowl for me. You know what I mean? That was so... I, I get so much more out of that than any other fan of, like, let's say the Patriots, for example. They didn't give a fuck if they win the last game of the season to make the playoffs. But for me, like, I, I was on the floor in the living room just, like, rolling around, happy as shit. You know? Happier than a pig did. It, it means more, you know? Honestly, that was the most important win we've had in 20 years. It was. For sure. It was the most important win since the AFC Championship game to put us into the Super Bowl. That was the one. And, um, you know, it kind of it, – it, it was kind of a thing where everything that we've done right and everything that we had done wrong in those last 20, 20 years showed up in that game. We almost gave the game away I don't know how many times. Uh, we let the other uh, team convert, I don't know how many, third and fourth downs. And we just were, were trying to give that game away at the end. And we, you know, we got gifted with uh, um, Staley being a little bit maybe greedy. And, uh, and it forced our hand to kind of, all right, well, let's win this shit then, you know. Uh, and we did. And, um, you know, it was it, – it's something that I can look back on. And I don't know if I can watch the game now. I think, I was, I think I'm still a little bit too close. Like, this this team is still together. That team is still together, I'm thinking. And this is why I'm saying I can't watch that game because we're still together right now. I, that's not going to be something I'm going to look fondly on and be like, oh, wow, because I know what happened in the season. I know what happened the next game because we took a dump against Cincinnati. Once it's all over and once once this team's kind of moved on, I think we can look I, – I, I personally – We'll be able to watch that game and be like, oh, okay, cool. That was a really cool game. I've watched that game, the full game, probably seven times. The highlights, probably 20 Just times. Beaten. Just a slow Just, beat the whole game. I mean, dude, it was, I mean, forget the outcome of the game. It was still an amazing fucking game, too. It was such a good game. The fact that we came out on top, the fact that it was at the expense of the Chargers and it got us into the playoffs in double overtime. Like, get the fuck out of here. It was, it was incredible. Incredible. All right, guys, that's it. That's our time for today. I want to make sure I, we, I didn't say in the beginning because, you know, everyone starts to talk shit, but make sure to like, comment, subscribe. Make sure in the bottom corner over there you hit that subscribe button. What does that do? I'll tell you. It gets you a notification every time that we go live, either myself or RJ go live, or we drop a new video for you. So make sure to like, comment, subscribe. Tell your friends, tell your haters, tell your mamas, tell your neighbors. Tell your neighbor's mama, tell everybody. Anybody you see with Raider gear on, man, be like, hey, man, nice hat. Do you listen to any podcasts? You know, pump up. If, if you like me, obviously, we're one of the guys that you listen to. But everyone else, too, man. There's a lot of good content creators out there. Shout out to all you guys. You guys do a lot of good work. All right. Until next time, guys. Knock on wood if you're with me. Congratulations for making it all the way to the end of our video. If you want Darren Waller to catch 20 touchdown passes next season and for Max Crosby to have 30 sacks, go ahead and subscribe and click the next video.